life has been focused on that, I feel better and more connected and more in love with life. And there are times when I have not been on that path and I've been doing a lot of internal searching and digging and trying to burn away the calluses that have built over my heart uh, around certain areas. And in those times, life seems harder. Life is more glim. Mm-hmm. It's cloudy. It's in hell outside, you know? And then those moments are also necessary. Like we're all, we're, there, there's always an opportunity to learn and to to excavate those parts of ourselves that need to be excavated. Yeah. But I do, I do know for me specifically, the more that I have focused on how can I, how can I, how can I bring joy to someone else's life? How can I serve humanity today? When I'm leading my life with those thoughts, my life is just more grand. <laughs> So welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Vision Builders. It's the show about freedom, where we uh, what, talk about what it is, what it takes to create it, and, of course, how to share it, and the age-old practice of, you know, leveraging other people's hindsight to bring clarity to our own developing stories. And with me today, longtime friend, um, gosh, we've been... I've, how long, man? Has it been 25 years, something like that? Did we meet in middle school or high school? It was middle school. Okay. It was for sure middle school. Um, and you came in at in sixth grade and I was in seventh grade, right? So like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sixth grade yeah. was, was that 93 for me? Bro. When that's funny. So we're talking like 26, 27 years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then the last time I saw you, I came to Ohio. That was what, 2011? That would have been 2011. It might have been 2012, but I'm pretty sure it was 11. No, it was for sure 11. It was November 11, because I just remembered the advert that we yes. made. Yes, because it was 11, 11, 11. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And I remember you were on this workout kick where you were doing this. It was something I hadn't seen before where you do a downward dog into like a shoulder push-up thing. And then yeah. that dog, and I was like, you, you were like, you might not be able to handle this. And I was like, I might not be able to handle this. <laughs> and, uh, I remember that was, that was funny. But, you know, us, us working out that day was kind of more you than me because you, you were like, you were on this thing where like, I just got to sweat at least once a day. And then you taught me about like shooting a basketball or doing something with your left hand to stimulate your – Oh yeah. Yeah, like if you're right-handed, do something with your left hand so you can stimulate Always. the creative side of your brain. And I was like, same thing with brushing your teeth. It's the same same thing like when you're cooking. Same thing when you reach the fridge. You know, we're such a right-handed, right-handed dominant culture. Like even scissors, yeah. you know, are made with right hands. And I think a lot of left-handed people complain about that. But like, for sure. A lot of left-handed people. And so for me, I do always, I still do that. I still think about how can I become as ambidextrous as possible uh just because and yes <laughs> like the creative part of your brain but also i just i just want to you watch basketball players and professional athletes and they're they are equally masterful on both hands yeah for sure i think dangerous is the word that comes to mind like they can go both ways because they, they have to and it's one of the separators i think for a lot of people yep. is learning to do what's uncomfortable and, uh, you know, we just jumped in. I mean, this is honestly, this is part of the course for like literally every conversation we've had in the last 15 years. It's like, we just, <laughs> just jump right in. You just jump into the depth. Yeah, You're man. Somebody that has a tremendous amount of depth. Well, uh, it's mutual, man. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to stem the tide of our obvious bromance here and um, just get, <laughs> get, get into, man, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, by the way, this is Travis Van Winkle. So this show is about freedom. And I want to explore that from a few different ways. And, you know, I have a definition for freedom, but I, I think it might be useful to start with, you know, when you hear that word, what, is that, what does that mean? Is that something that has even been a construct of your thinking? And if so, what, is, what does freedom mean, mean for you? I freedom, I mean, I instantly think slavery and African-Americans and how there hasn't been equal freedom in our country. Wow. That's when I, when I come to freedom, I don't think like this wide open, like eagle flying through a mountainous, beautiful region. I don't, I don't see that. I, I see how there's been a lack of Interesting. In culture. And I yeah. think you know, right now it's ever prevalent, but I think it's always been 
a hot topic. And um, I think my freedom has been, I've been gifted a greater amount of freedom than so many, I mean, than, than possibly even you yourself in this country. You know, I don't go around be having to worry about being arrested or I don't have to go around uh, having racist comments thrown at me. I don't have to have this, this systemic battle of, of uh, being excluded because of my name or because of my color. Or, you know, it's like yeah. I, I feel like when, when, when you say the word freedom, I, it's a little sad. I the, like the thing that comes up is there's a sadness in me because it's like we don't have true freedom in this country. That's, that's interesting. I, you know, one of the reasons secretly that I guess not so much of a secret because I keep saying it out loud. Like one of the reasons <laughs> that, I, that I that I wanted to do this show is because like um, I have this running theory that if you if you take any person from any place in the world and you put them next to any other person from any place in the world, you give them a translator that within about an hour, they will find some common ground and might even be laughing together. Like there are so many more things that we have in common than there are differences. And I, I, we live, we've kind of come to a point in history where um, at least now it seems to me like we are hyper-focusing on our differences. And I don't know that that's healthy. Um, or because, you know, shared, shared experience does not mean shared ex perspective, but we don't seem to bother as often anymore to get in and learn other people's perspectives. Um, and I, I don't know that there's any, like, I think of, I mean, you, you've got siblings too, but my, my older brother and I grew up in the same house, right? Like ate the same food, listened to the same music, you know, we were BMG music. Down, downloaded we're, the same unconscious of your parents. Right, right, exactly. But my brother, who is one of the best men I know, would crack under the pressure of having to speak for me. Now, this is a dude who grew up in the same house. And if there's anyone who has any, as much in there's no one walking the planet who has as much shared experience, right? Yet, he would know better than to try to guess what I would think about a thing. And in the same way, I know I can't speak for him. And so what I find interesting is like, we're all, we all have varying degrees of shared experience, but it's this, it's, it's the conversations that we have. It's the bread that we break together that I feel like gives life to the, the perspectives that we, we hold and how we came to those things. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like for a lot of people, I want to talk about how different um, how, how we came to different places of our own um, achievement of, of, of influence or whatever it is that we bring to the table. Um, but really, I feel like the, the side effect can be that a lot of people can like look at, magnify, if you will, what we have in common, like our, our common human ex experience and start to go like, well, no, we're not alone. Like we're not the only ones. I'm not the only one who thinks that or I don't, I'm not the only one who has that fear or concern. I, I love that you're saying that too, because you, you called me last Friday and I was having my certain, there's been certain things in my life that I've been working through. And, you know, we notice we're, we're, we're so pattern driven as creatures. And so I, there's, there's some patterns in my life that maybe haven't been the most productive. And I've been processing, breaking through those and reconstruct, deconstructing my mm -hmm. life over the last couple of years and, and really creating a path that I consciously that I want to go in forward and just going through the process of, of embracing change and all these things. And you called when I was having a moment of deep reflection and you just sharing about your life and what you were going through was an absolute reflection and a almost almost like a breadcrumb that you were tossing in front of me for the things that I was thinking about that I needed a little bit of guidance on. But you didn't know that. No clue. You, know, you were just sharing about your last couple of years. And it was like for me, though, sharing our perspectives like that, we're always, we don't know why we're being called somewhere. We don't know, like, wow, I had an impulse to call uh, Klachiku. Hmm, let me call. You, you had an impulse. There was a connection that needed to happen there, and you answered it. And I had to call right away 
and we both were gifted something from it. And I feel like those pers- when we when we honor that voice inside of ourselves, yeah. there's always an opportunity to share your perspective with someone, and it's it's it matters. Yeah, it really does. And sometimes we won't even know the reach that we have, or we, we won't even know the impact that we have. We just have Bro. to honor that direction. We have to honor that impulse. We have to honor that desire to connect. I, that's I, really what's underneath everything. That's exactly right. And honestly, like I'm, I'm being blessed right now because, <laughs> you know, you never know exactly what that's going to mean. But, you know, one of the things that I, you know, my kids are still really young, but at the same time, like one of the things that I've determined in my mind that I want to make sure that they pick up, they catch which means I have to embody it. Like, it's not one of those things. Some yeah. things are not really taught in life. They're caught, right? They're, 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 we just see them modeled. And, and, you know, I want my life, the wake of my life to be answered prayers all over the world. Like, that's kind of like one of the things that I just, hey, man, I want my life to move, be moving closer to the point where I can bless a lot of people, right? And so, and I don't even have to know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to know that I'm doing it, but I I feel like there's something to be said for when you have an impulse to just connect to somebody that that didn't come from nowhere, right? Like, on the other side of that connection is is somebody maybe awaiting an answer that you didn't even know you had to give, right? And so um, I want want to, I want to kind of go back a little bit in time maybe um because one thing that i've noticed one pattern that i've kind of found as i work with people as i talk with people and in the kind of in this new format interview people which is weird like i had to admit to myself the other day that this is in fact an interview format when in fact i was like no i'm just having conversations with my friends you know um but one pattern that keeps emerging is that somewhere along the line when people are walking into um, kind of big stages of, of influence, of contribution, you know, uh, of impact in the world, that every single one of those so far, there's some experience or some relationship that empowered their belief that it was possible, right? And, I, you know, one, th- one question that I would have for you is, is if you were to look back, can, can, you, can you pinpoint or maybe guess a series of, or was there, was there something like that for you that, that you would say, um, like made me believe that the life that I'm now living, which is hard to even imagine project in the future, but like looking back, is there somebody or a group of somebodies that influenced your belief that it was possible? I mean, I, I think the answer that is coming to me that's most clear is through stories. And through literature, through yeah, movies, yeah. you know, you watch certain characters achieve something great. They, you know, they, they climb out of the gutter and they make something of themselves in their life. They, they, they achieve greatness. Or you watch Michael Jordan living perfection on a basketball court. That's why every yeah. time you wa- I watch a story being told where, where someone's overcoming something and finding that, that freedom you taught and finding that expression, finding that mastery, there is, I cry because there's a part of me that knows that exists in me too. And I can recognize it. Therefore I can, I can embody that. Mm -hmm. I don't know when I'm going to get there. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take, but because I can see it, you spot it, you got it. Yeah. And I, I think, so stories is one of those things that, that has really opened up the, the gateway for me to believe that anything is possible Maybe even Adidas, because that's their slogan. Mm-hmm. Anything is possible. You know, you, you see yeah. it written everywhere. <laughs> um, but, but actual, like, people in my life, um, I, don't, I, I don't, no one really jumps out at me. I know that there are people in my life. I just think that there's always been, I, I grew up with a, a good amount of freedom. I grew up where, the world was my oyster. If I wanted to play football, my parents were like, okay. If I wanted to go do this, they're like, all right, we'll take you. If I wanted to read a certain book, all right, we'll go buy it for you. You know, let's go to the lake tomorrow. Okay. You know, there was always, I felt like I had an ask and I, it was, it was received. And I feel like that over the course of the, my childhood, that just instills this, 
like I can do these things, these ideas that I have, they can manifest. Mm -hmm. And so, so maybe my, my mom and my dad, I think is probably where I could start where they would really honor the things that, that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So it was something where there, there usually wasn't a closed door in my life, unless it was like, there was a girl that I really wanted to date. My mom was like, she's not, she's not a good kid. You can't, or you can't hang out with that boy. He's into drugs. Yeah. Like there was certain, you know, of course there was certain no's and limitations, but I think for the most part, my parents really honored the desire in me to want to explore. And so there's this ex exploration, this, this, this part of me that is, I can see a mountaintop and I go, I'm going to climb that and I'll go climb it. I'm like, Oh wow, I did that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's next? And so it's, I think it's this, it's this accumulation of wanting something and achieving it, wanting yeah. something, and achieving it. And you add those up over the course of my old childhood, you know, in my teen years, you know, I want to, I want to play, I want to start on the football team. Great. I started, I started on the football team as a junior. I broke records for most receptions in a game, in a season. Um, whatever it was, there was always everything that I put my effort into, I exceeded that. And mm -hmm. so that instills a belief that whatever I choose to do that's, that feels like a real calling, the doors are going to open. Because right. so far, everything I've done up until this point, that's been the case. So it's, it's proven to me that that's going to work. So why would it not work in anything else that I try? And so I... I believe that maybe that's that's quantitative, that's data. It's worked, <laughs> it's worked so far, and and I think there's also some blind faith. Mm -hmm. the blind faith is like you know I think that I can achieve anything that I want as long as I work hard. I'm a good person. I'm kind, and I'm a team player, and I just have yeah. fun. Yeah, I can do anything. Well, it's fun. It's funny that you say that because like I want to get back to a conversation that you and I had years ago. I think back in 2011 when you're I'm about probably going to forget which is which is why okay. crazy I, I don't remember all of the conversation but there are certain moments that stood out but like one thing I, I I hope everybody who's listening to this catches I hope you like rewind play it again you know I love that we got the, the opportunity to witness you come to that because what you essentially said in bullet points was my parents opened the door of belief for me for the entirety of my formative years, right? And so, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of people, they kind of have to find that person. Um, they were there from the beginning, you know? And, and one thing that, that you telling me that was what triggered this memory was like, you're talking about a gratitude scape, right? Like, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. We, and you were telling me, you know, cause back when you came to, when you came to Ohio, the reason you came is back then I was running a talent development studio and I was teaching actors and, you know, and I was like, I, right, my buddy Travis is an actor in LA. Let's, yeah, <laughs> he can maybe I say some things. I got to teach your students for a weekend and it was so great that opportunity because it allowed me to stop and look at my, myself and what I've achieved and the belief system that I'd created around acting and go, well, what would I teach right now to myself if I were just starting? Right. So it, it was, was really, awesome. It was a really fun way for me to actually, take a look back and just see what I've built so far as, as a system, as, uh, as uh, almost like a technique inside of myself. And so uh -huh. it actually strengthened, it strengthened my ability to act because whenever you teach something, it just, it, it almost, it cements the, the knowledge. Yeah. Of the yeah, it does. And um, you talked about just like the rampant rejection, so to speak, and that you kept the, in this notebook, like all every, you, you tracked every audition you went on and you highlighted the ones that you got callbacks and in a different color, you highlighted the ones where you actually got booked. I and then, doing that again. Yeah. And, and, and the ratios were like, you know, you did, you obviously you were working, so you did book stuff, but the amount of auditions, the amount of at bats that you had in order to just book the ones that you did were in some points, in some points of your career, you said, I think you used the word demoralizing, right? Like, <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of rough. And yet you were a working actor. And, and one of the things that you talked about was this idea, because one, one of the things we brought up in, in the class too, was this idea of vulnerability. Mm. And, and we talked about it like this, like if, if vulnerability is this active living thing on the inside of you, it's the ability to kind of 
expose it and let somebody touch it, right? Like, but, but our natural bend is to, by the way, I, I, I continue to teach actors and I continue to use that imagery for years after that. Um, but this, <laughs> this idea that we, our natural bend is to cover that up with all the layers of defense that we can, but in order to do good work, you have to open it up. And then you said these words, you said, my acting career really started to take off when I stopped focusing so much on being a good actor and started focusing on just being a good person. Mm, interesting. And, um, and that stuck with me because it's, the implications of that are not, they're not just about acting. Literally true about everything, right? Uh, and, and the reason I would say that is like this- This came up for myself. The more that we search for ourselves, the less likely we are to find ourselves. But the more that we search for God and to serve our fellow man, the more profoundly acquainted we will become with ourselves and the more inwardly assured. That is one of the great spiritual laws of life. That's by Shoghi Effendi. But that, that idea that the more we focus on ourselves, the less we're going to be, become acquainted with ourselves. The more that we mm -hmm. focus on others and how to serve others and be with others, something greater than ourselves, we gain and glean more perspective of who we really are. Perspective. That's the truth because like life is contextual. Influence is contextual. Like, um, you know, this, this idea that you can have influence by mastering yourself by yourself is fantasy. And it's a bad fantasy at that because like people who go down that road, it's a dark road. It's a lonely road. It's almost like what they say about, about the yogis. You know, you, you go and you meditate in a cave for, for all of your life, but how can you exist? How can that peace that you've found exist in city living? How can it exist when you have people that are, you know, you have all these noises, you have people that are annoying you, you have, mm -hmm. you have the challenges of normal life. And it's like, you, you, you can't live in a cave for all you have to do. You, you have to find, you have to, you have to strive to find that in real life. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, like, what is all the enlightenment in the world worth if you don't get a chance to love on other people? Like, right. Like you might, you might master your breathing and live for 150 years because you've, you've done all the work, right? But like, if, if you can't make somebody's life better by just serving some other people, like what have you really done, right? Yeah. So like, I, I, find, I find that fascinating because, um, you know, that, that whole idea of, of, of serving, of, of really finding ways to you know, to help other people and, and make other people's um, journey a concern to you, right? Like, I want to I want to make it a concern of mine that the people around me have an opportunity to, to know more, have more, be more <laughs> because whenever, of a relationship. Whenever with my me. life has been focused on that, I feel better and more connected and more in love with life. And there are times when I have not been on that path and I've been doing a lot of internal searching and digging and trying to burn away the calluses that it built over my heart uh, around certain areas. And in those times, life seems harder. Life is more glim. Mm -hmm. It's cloudy as hell outside, you know? And then those moments are also necessary. Like we're all, we're, there, there's always an opportunity to learn and to, to excavate those parts of ourselves that need to be excavated. Yeah, but I do. I do know for me specifically, the more that I have focused on how can I, how can I make other people smile? How can I, how can I bring joy to someone else's life? How can I serve humanity today? When I'm leading my life with those thoughts, my life is just more grand and it's more full. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of this quote by Saint Therese. It's like, let us love since our heart is made for nothing else. And it's just so, so true. Yeah. Yet, I think it's easy to forget that sometimes because we are inundated with our goals. We're inundated with what we need to achieve. We're inundated with, with potential, uh, you know, if you have kids and your family and wife, you've got all these different relationships that you have to navigate. You've got the, the hierarchical dynamics of, of the workplace or whatever it is. There's always, there's going to be challenges that you have your yeah. health challenges. You, you're, you're not getting, proper sleep you're 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 fighting the whole aging process and your body's changing and shift all these things we're going through life the, the constant in life is change and i think it's always going to be tough if you want it to be and there's another quote i actually have it written up here 
I like this one. We, we either make ourselves happy or miserable. The amount of work is the same. Yes. Like Carlos Benada. Yeah. Like that's such an interesting quote. Yeah. Like no, there, there's no escaping the suffering, the trouble. I mean, um, in, in this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said, right? Like, but take courage because I've overcome the world, right? So the question is, like, is your suffering going to bring you closer to God or further away? Like, that's the question, right? And, you know, people, whatever their, whatever their, their faith uh, background or faith journey is, that's not the point of, of, of this, but, like, there's something in us all that I believe is very closely uh, in need of, of shaping how we treat other people in the context of, of how that is the feedback chamber of like how that is feeding back our own, our own story. But we can't focus on our own story if we actually want to be good at the first thing that feeds. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the cyclical sort of thing. So anyway, um, you know the story and, and then I'll continue. I'm probably going to butcher the story, but it's a Buddhist story about the farmer. Have you heard of it? No. So there's a farmer and he has a horse and this horse runs away one night and his neighbor comes over and says, oh, that's such a shame that you lost your horse. What bad luck. And the farmer says, maybe. The next morning, the horse comes back with three stallions. And the, the neighbor was like, oh my God, what, how much fortune do you have? This is amazing. And the farmer goes, maybe. The son is riding one of the horses and falls off and breaks his leg. The neighbor comes over and says, what terrible misfortune you have your son broke his leg and the farmer's like well maybe the next day the army comes and they're they're basically rounding up people to go and fight in the war and his son doesn't have to go and as the the neighbor comes over he's like we should celebrate your son doesn't have to go to war he's like maybe this idea and I, i'm sure i butchered that story but this idea that we don't know why things are happening to us that guy could have chosen to suffer that his horse ran away mm -hmm. But you don't know. This too shall pass. You don't know what that's going to bring. It brought him good fortune. His son broke his leg. That's a tremendous amount of cause for suffering. Yeah. But let me not let me not marinate on that. It's a choice. But he did it. And so I, I feel like there's gifts in everything if we choose to look at it. And it's so hard to do. Easy to say. Yeah. But that story that made me think of that story. It's like this idea that suffering is inevitable. It's just it's a matter of our perspective about yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that's true. I mean, I feel like we, one of the great gifts of humanity is that we have the choice to decide the meaning that we, we assign to different, different circumstances. Like that's remarkable. We're not just smart apes. You know what I mean? Like that is, that is something special to be able to decide what to make of this, mm -hmm. this thing that is, could be horrible or it could be amazing. What do we make of it? And, you know, Ed Milet uh, has got a book called Max Out, and in it he talks about um, this idea of, like, what you focus on. You know, what, 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 you, what you think about, you bring about. And he talks about the experience of happiness is a consequence of the, the quality of the questions you ask yourself. Yeah. Right? And, yeah, and the quality of your attention. And yes. And you choose to put it. Like, if attention is a currency, that we have, how are you spending that every day? Man. Like, I wanna choose to choose, I wanna spend my currency of attention on this, on, on reading this book today, on writing this paper, on uh, you know, exercising my body, whatever it is. And if you can choose to put your attention somewhere and actually follow through, amazing. But a lot of times <laughs> we choose to put our attention somewhere and then our mind wanders. And then we gotta yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's interesting too, because like, your attention is going somewhere. And if so much of our, our life's experience has to do with where we put our attention, wouldn't we want to choose where that attention is going? Because there's no vacuum of attention. Now, could you say that that's freedom? I would say Being no. Able to choose. I would say yes, men. I, you know, again, I, I hope that everybody takes a minute and, and goes back a little bit because I think we just struck on something because like you're, you, that is, I believe freedom, it, my working definition of freedom is pretty simple. It's not a big brainiac sort of definition. It's the ability to create that which 
brings you joy and blesses other people. That's it. And to me, in my mind, if I can be in a space where I can create, whether it's this conversation or whether it's clarity for somebody that I'm working with, um, I don't know that it matters so much, but if I have the ability, the efficacy, so to speak, the impact in the world to, to, to bless other people in a way that also brings me joy, I'm 100% free. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I believe that, that a big part of that is what you just said, like the ability to direct our attention and decide what we experience because we can't decide the circumstances, right? But we, but we absolutely can, uh, uh, we can control, we can direct the meaning we pull from, from the circumstances. Right. So that's so good, man. Embodying like a, a neutral position, therefore being able to choose the meaning you want to place on things. And that's, I mean, that's mastery right there. I think so. And what's crazy is like, um, I don't know if you had, uh, there was a, there was a baccalaureate service my senior year, like when I, when I graduated, um, Dr. Chan Tolbert, like I've never, I'd never met her before. I have never seen her since, but I remember her <laughs> because at the baccalaureate service, she talked about how there, the, if there's one thing she would want to tell every graduating senior of the class of 99, it was that there is no vacuum of intention in this world. You were either building up or you were tearing down. There is no, you were, you were either making things better or you're making things worse. You cannot, there is no sideline to sit on. And One of my favorite quotes was always, you gotta leave it better than you found it. Mm-hmm. With, that, with that essence, it's, it's, you're always wanting to build something up. But also if you think about, there's a, a Hindu philosophy, creation, maintenance destruction repeat that's the flow of life sometimes things need to be torn down sometimes things need to die look at our seasons you know you have to go through the harvest the harvest then has to to, to die off it has to the, the the nutrients have to go back into the earth yeah. then have, you have to wait for spring for them to, to come back up and rise it's like there's yeah. this whole process that we're also experiencing in our lives every day and so i think I think a big part of the challenge, at least I can speak for myself, is the letting go and the times when things are meant to die, mm-hmm. letting them, letting it go and really letting it go so that you can move on and, and create something new. And I think that's the hardest thing. And, you know, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to um, uh, leave sight of the shore. That mm-hmm. whole quote, you know, it's like, that's another area that causes suffering in our life is the ability is, is our, uh, our, our attachment and our aversion to letting go. Mm-hmm. Well, it's anticipatory fear. Like fear is adaptive. Like it's useful. If you and I are on a trail run and you know, we hear that sound, right? Like actually heard it. We don't think we heard it. We're not afraid it might happen. Like we're running and we hear it, <laughs> right? Identifying where that's coming from and deciding to run the other way or take a different path, that's adaptive, right? That's, that's useful. Mm-hmm. What's not useful, however, is going for a trail run so frozen with fear that you can't enjoy it because you're afraid that you might hear or you heard that somebody got bitten by a snake on this trail and you just can't, you just yeah. can't that's enjoy what a beautiful day it is because you're anticip- anticipating the one minute possibility of what could go wrong. So you're missing all this amazing because you, you're consumed with the- Oh yeah, your lens is fractured. Yeah. The lens from which you're viewing life is fractured, anticipatory anxiety. It is, and it's a telescope too, because like you're, you're, you're casting the sphere <laughs> off into the future, mm-hmm. right? It's not present, it's like, of all the infinite possibilities of things that could go in my favor, all I'm going to do is look through this little bitty hole at the one thing that could suck. <laughs> and what is that inspiring you to do? Tell everyone else on the hike, hey, there's a snake up here. Hey, look, check, check that out. Be careful. There's a snake up here. So you're instilling fear on other people. Yeah, it becomes a contagion. 
you said something earlier that I, I, I didn't want to miss is you talk about how like sometimes it's very hard. You talk about mastery, how it's, it's hard to direct your, um, your attention. And you talk about it as, as, as currency. And one thing that, that, you know, comes to mind really when I hear something like that is it's hard to do when we're on an island and it just makes me think, you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to time date these things because I hope that this conversation brings value to people for years to come. But at the moment of this recording, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I think we're all uh, at varying degrees of, of dealing with it, right? Um, but one thing that it has shown me is how deeply we need each other, right? Like, it's made me insanely grateful for every way we can connect with other human beings, you know what I mean? Uh, because it is very difficult when the only voice in your head is yours. And it's very difficult to stay present, to not focus on the past or project off into the future, all these things that we can't possibly know, um, which then steals our energy. So, so um, I, I, I love, I love that idea of, of, of attention being a currency that we're, we're, we're mastering you know, so um, real quick, right now, you know, we've, we've done a lot of talking as friends, um, but I, I would feel like it would be kind of a jerk move for us to, you know, do this and for people not to know you or how to connect with, with you or, or anything that you're doing. Um, one thing I want to say, uh, I'm, hopefully, you know, you're a bastion of humility uh, most of the time. Uh, <laughs> um, 78% of the time. 78% of the time, which, by the way, wasn't necessarily always the case. Um, but I think wonderfully that has been, that has been the way, that's been your story, man, for kind of, kind of a while now. And, um, so you wouldn't do this, but I would say um, Travis puts out some of the most like fun, silly, uplifting sort of content, uh, mostly because I think, I'm attaching meaning, right, to, to, to you, but because I think you dig it. Like, that's like, a, that's a feeling, I, the sense that I get is like the content you put out is sincerely just because you dig it. You think it's fun <laughs> and funny. And you're like, hey, is it you know, like somebody is like eating something delicious and they're, they're walking around like, hey, you need to taste this. This is amazing. I can't just eat this by myself. I feel like that's kind of how your content is. It's like, ah, this is delicious and I should share this meal with other people. And, uh, you know, because you're saying that, because it's being received in that way, it makes me really happy because I set the intention, because social media is a really complicated thing. And <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> it is something, I don't know if you've watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, but I just watched it. And, and it's, it's information that's been out there for a long time. But, you know, we are the product that's being sold to advertisers. There is no restrictions. There, there, there is no regulations in how much data they can mine from us. And we're giving it freely. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this, this process that's destroying children. And it's like, it's, it's a really scary thing. And it's also destroying adults and our, our mentality and, and how we're, 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 we're thinking we're, we're gaining connection while we're actually diminishing our connection yeah. in a lot of ways. And then we're cultivating these, these, these identities that we want to be. And it's not always oh, a who we are. So yeah. the adult divides and we're, it's polarizing our viewpoints. We're only surrounded by and inundated with the content and the, the belief systems that, that we believe. So then we're just marinating in, 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 in one small little hub of, of, of what is the true reality. And it's creating divisive. It's this, there's, it's really dangerous yeah, there's so many beautiful elements to social media and to mm -hmm. technology and it is the future and, and it, it is going to bring, it's going to save humanity as much as it's going to destroy it. And so it's, it's, it's these two things that are living simultaneously, these possibilities. Um, but because that negative possibility of destruction exists at the same time, there's a, a tremendous amount of tact that I believe is necessary when approaching social media. Mm -hmm. And so for you saying that that's how you're receiving my content is really beautiful because I made the intention that I want to post things that make me laugh. I want to tell stories that, that I'm chuckling to that mean something to me. I want to post things that are like truly meaningful and real 
in my life, regardless if they're me struggling about something or if it's me holding a bag of my own shit that I had to pick up when I was camping that made me laugh. And I'm like, I normally pick up my dog. That's mine. <laughs> you know, it's, I probably shouldn't have posted that, but it made me laugh. And so I did. And so in order, my main thing about how I'm, how I post on social media is I just want to be authentic to me. And I think I, I hope, and also how can I connect in, in being authentic to myself and telling stories that I like and being silly in the ways that I am and sharing, sharing that vulnerability that we talked about that I'm going through. It's, it's also an opportunity to really connect and to, uh, to invite others to share their vulnerability on social media as well. When it's mm-hmm. such, when it's a market where it's really just a highlight reel. And I, I, I I'm glad that you picked up what I'm putting down. <laughs> that is exactly my, that was an intention that I made in March when the whole pandemic hit. It's like, I have a lot of time to spend now sharing my life. Mm-hmm. I want to do it in a way that really matters and makes sense to my heart and my mind and my sense mm-hmm. of humor, and my personality. Well, I want you to know, brother, like it's, it's kind of, re- it's your content is refreshing in that way. Like it's a, because the thing is, objective reality is a difficult thing anyway, but it's even closer to impossible when you're by yourself all the time, right? Like when I say objective reality, I mean, being honest about who you are and who you're not is hard because we, I mean, we constantly fight. I mean, I, I don't think I'm the only one who constantly fights this urge to put up the ESPN uh, highlight reel, right, of my life. And pretend as though that's who I really am when it's not. I mean, ask my wife, she'll tell you all about it. Like that's so like when you don't have people to kind of check you and not in a mean way or in a like, you know, get bent sort of way, but like who will just, you know, lovingly and sometimes in, with humor, like let you know where you actually stand <laughs> as opposed to what you think, what you're trying to put out there. So, um, I, I hope that we're looking at a future where more people, um, when they post their stuff, it's it's truer to who they actually are, right? Like we all struggle with things. We all go through these cycles um, where we are on the top of the mountain heading back towards the valley. But, you know, it doesn't feel that way when we're on the mountain. And I think more people would do well to understand, like, your your rap sheet dude is impressive but you're you (laughs) all the time (laughs) wherever you go and what i mean by that is like regardless of what you did yesterday that doesn't change your general concern for what you still have to do today who you have to be how you have to show up and like you know if i came on here i mean i think the typical thing to do in a scenario like that where is you know, because we've been friends for a long time, but if, you know, if I'm trying to grow a show is to sit here and go, okay, well, it's Travis Van Winkle, and then to list, like, your credits. To have pulled your IMDb page and go, like, can you believe this guy? But for me, that's See, but toxic. I, well, but I also look at that and I go, we, everything can be compared. There's always a higher mountain to climb, because I look mm-hmm. at my resume and I go, all right, well, that's that. But I mean, look at that guy's resume <laughs> or look at that girl's resume. Like mine is, mine pales in comparison. So like, wow, that's fantastic. And it's so beautiful. And it's brought me to where I am now. And I, I know I've trajected where I'm going and where I want to go. And it's really exciting. And all the possibilities are there. And it's, there's always more. There's always more. I don't think, I mean, maybe Michael Jordan, and that's the second time I've referenced him. Maybe he can go. <laughs> yeah, I did. yeah, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I, I can rest this jersey and never have to never have to think again of like, oh well, what if? Well, maybe if I could have. Nope, he did it. Yeah. But I think for, the, for us mere mortals, I think most of the time, every we we reach a certain plateau, and to some, they haven't started that climb yet and so it, it's this crazy resume that might look amazing but to me i'm like cool that's done accomplish that now what's next because i want to get to 
to, to where I want to go. And then I'll get to that place and I'm going to go, okay, now I got there. Wow, shit. It, there's still more to go, isn't there? And I want to get to the next place. So this is never ending cycle of wanting to achieve. And so f success, I, I've been really trying to figure out what is success to me because, you know, you mentioned, you, know, you could say that there's this long list on my resume. Yes, that is that is quantitative success in some regards. I booked this, I did this movie, I was on this show, I did this, I made this money, I did this, this won the box office, da, 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 Sure. But that doesn't mean that inside of myself, I feel successful. That doesn't mean inside of myself, I mean, I, I, I want to feel like, I, for me, building, I want to build mastery in mm -hmm. areas of my life. I want to build wisdom i want to start i want to i want to build a happier a consistently happy existence like those are the things that matter to me now resume absolutely matters i want to continue to climb that <laughs> i want to be happy in the process of doing it go. like as as a i'm 37 now it's like i don't want to experience my life and be looking at the most beautiful view this like let's say i'm at glacier national park i don't want to be looking at the most beautiful scenery and be spinning in agony or suffering around something that I didn't do or didn't achieve or some regret or shame or whatever. I, I, I want to be able to, or if you have kids, I want to be able to experience fully the love of my life for the children that I have. And the, 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 those things are coming. And I want to be able to experience that rather than be stuck in my head thinking about what I could have done or what I need to do or what I, what I want to do. It's just presence. Success is like really being able to be present in what's happening and just consistently find this place in yourself where you you can be content regardless of the pending suffering that's like always available <laughs> yeah. yeah that's i mean that's powerful and honestly like man there's so much to that because, you know, I guess one question that comes to mind is like, so what, what's the process? Because you just said success is. But I would say that that's freedom too. Like being able to be present. If I can be present and just breathe and recognize I've got a lot going for me. I've, you know, and I could go down the list, but like not just going for me, but in the context of the relationships that I have, my friendship with you, like, Whatever it might be, I can be, I can stand and, and pile an entire edifice of gratitude to stand on. And in this moment, it's enough. Now, that's not to say that I don't hustle, that I don't, I don't go after the next thing. But I feel like, you know, as Tony Robbins, is, uh, I, he's quoting somebody else when he says it. But I think he's, he might be quoting Jim Rohn because he's often quoting Jim Rohn, his, his mentor. But, you know, it's like success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure mm. right like if you achieve all the things but you're not happy mm -hmm. that's that's way worse than not achieving anything at all because now you have a crisis of conscience you have an existential crisis right like what did it all mean and all the sacrifices that i made to get here and the relationships that didn't flourish because you know all that all of that stuff and so um Man, I, I feel like I feel like we're kind of hitting on something that is pretty pretty key to this idea of like not just success or freedom, but also influence. Because then the other question is not just how do you create freedom, but how do you share it? Because I feel like in the same way that on that trail scenario that you can share anxiety, I feel like we can also share freedom. We can also share. Um, perspective and and peace and we can also share that that you know grace that that and, and mercy and like the things that actually make life matter right like giving people not what they deserve but what would make their life better if they understood right so that I feel like make being able to make those choices I, I, has a lot to do with the experience of happiness that we're having day to day so Man, I wish we could talk all day. I really do. Well, we can. It's uh, the pandemic. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's, speaking of the pandemic, so so you kind of painted a little bit of picture for me 
Um, but what's going on out there in the, the, the wild, wild west, uh, the not so barren wasteland that is Hollywood? Uh, well, know, what does it look like? It's taken a turn. I feel like now that people are starting to get a better grip on, on what this thing is and, and how to really mitigate it. I feel like, you know, you're in a bubble. The NBA's done a great job. Our productions are kind of following that same thing where they're filming inside of a bubble. You're, you're having to take a tremendous amount of protocol while filming and you're going to be away from your family and you can't have a lot of visitors on set. And there's only a certain amount of uh, bandwidth you have to really go out and explore a city. If, say, if you're filming in Vancouver, you, you can't, you, some of the freedoms that we have in our normal life are going to be taken away, but it's for a greater good and the greater, mm -hmm. the greater cause of, of working and telling stories and making a living and just being <laughs> creative and all these things and getting this business, this industry back up and running. And I think it's, it's starting to happen now. I feel like things are really starting to take off. And eventually I think what's going to happen is the, the, we're going to find a way for this business to get back to the, the, the fullness that it was and in this new way. And then the pandemic is going to be over and then we're just going to be able to go back to normal. <laughs> so like we're going to have to spend all this time to figure out how to, how to manage it. And then we're going to figure it out. And right when we figure it out, it's going to be over. Yeah. Well, uh, we can, we can hope. I have so enjoyed this conversation for, for what it's worth time spent with you, um, and just having this conversation has made, has enriched my life. And, you know, obviously I hope that it enriches other people's lives, but if it was just for me, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Anytime we have a conversation, I always feel like I'm inspired to want to just be a, be a, a more giving, loving, sincere person. And I think that's something that you really rock and you don't, it's not something you try that's something that you're like let me just let me see if i can build this in myself you just are and i think that's also success is when you can just be who you are well or, i appreciate yeah. you saying that yeah um, you and can't say thing. that though without shouting out to my parents like honestly i sincerely believe that i grew up with an insane amount of privilege because of who my parents are yeah and uh uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like I got to live this life a few steps ahead from 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 birth in that way, and um, I'm grateful. Uh, oh, look who it is! <laughs> I love that that came up in the conversation because I haven't really thought about that. You know, when you first asked me about freedom, I was uh, who who really inspired that? It's like no one's really coming to mind. And it took me, it just, like, you allowed me to the process of going through it. And it, it almost felt like a therapy session. And uh, it, it became very clear what that was. Uh, yeah, I think it did. And, you know, make sure you, you, you tag your parents uh, in whatever this is uh, so that they can hear you coming to the realization that they always suspected that you would <laughs> when they were making all those sacrifices on your behalf yeah. back in, in the day. You know, so, one thing, but, you know, I just want to, just for anyone that might be listening that's in the industry or, or, or in any industry that's really cutthroat and which I guess is every industry really, uh, but this idea of rejection you mentioned, it doesn't change. So I told, this was 11 years ago, 10 years, nine years ago that I saw you and I, I told mm -hmm. you initially when I came to Los Angeles, I started auditioning and I would write down every audition. I would highlight the ones that I got a uh, call back for. I'd circle the ones that I booked. And out of 75 auditions, I finally, like I had, I had callbacks in there, but I finally booked one. And that was my first booking. And then I think number 79 I booked and then 84. And then it, was, it started like a, a life is about momentum. Mm -hmm. You watch basketball. I'm doing a lot of the basketball analogies, but as long as you can maintain your composure in those times when the momentum is not on your side, you don't lose a sense of who you are. You don't lose a sense of your confidence. You know that you got a great shot. You know your team knows how to play team ball. You can weather the storm of the other team being badass in that moment. You're going to have your momentum shift. So if you stay in the game long enough, if you continue to maintain your composure amidst the rejection, it's going to turn your way. I believe that. That's something that I've always believed, and I believe that's where that anything is possible comes in because it, it's it's going to turn. And I think just to show you how that's still relevant, the last two years I didn't I didn't work for like a year. I was under a contract with CBS. I was on a holding deal, but the the, the show that I was supposed to go on to didn't go, and I I just booked a pilot for CBS in March, and 
we went to go film and then they sent us home because of COVID. So we're still figuring out what the heck's going to happen. But I wrote down all the auditions that led the year before that led up to that. And I had 34 auditions, zero callbacks. And I booked 35. So every audition I had, no feedback, no like, hey, we're really interested. No pin, no like, we think you might be the right guy. Nothing. So crickets for 34 auditions for a whole year. And then I booked 35. And so it's, it's, that's, that's now. That's, <laughs> it hasn't changed. Clutch. Yeah. Just like, like, out of here. It's just, <laughs> dude. So for those of you that are actually pursuing something that requires a tremendous amount of grit, like, that's what you signed up for, you know? And I hate to use my, this word, but you're, you're going to have to eat shit. You know, you're going to have to be really great at an audition. You're going to have to be really great in that job interview. You're going to have to show up and be the best person there and not get the job sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of the way it is. Wow. And weathering those storms and maintaining your composure within the storm, knowing that your momentum is going to come as long as you stay in the game. Like that's such an important thing that I've learned over the years, and I hope to continue that. I've been in the game now for almost 20 years. Hopefully that, that's just something that stays. Um, but I, I think that's been something that has helped with the idea of my definition of freedom and success. Yeah. That's powerful, man. I, okay, so I've switched. I've switched my perspective of, like, the most powerful things you said in this, in this time. Like, that, man, I think is the one, is one thing that is – applicable to literally everyone that wants to go do something like when it's supposed to go build something um not everybody does not everybody has the will right to to do that but like for anyone entrepreneurial sales uh any any relational thing where rejection is a part of the gig so yesterday i was in a training um actually i have a, a coach in san diego um, who obviously I'm not in San Diego, otherwise I'd, you know, I'd ride up the road and come knock on your door. But uh, we're talking about how, you know, with your teams, you need to reward not just the outcomes, but you need to reward the effort. And we talked about how, you know, there's this, there's this kind of dichotomy between will and skill. And for the first time in my whole life, it occurred to me that not only can you measure effort and, or reward it, and measure outcomes and reward it, you can measure will. For you, it's, it's doing the work when you have no idea of the outcome and showing up anyway, right? Going on that audition. Actually doing the, the um, literary, uh, emotional, and actual preparation to go and audition for something when you have no idea how it's going to go. In my business, it's, it's the phone calls, right? It's it's making sure that I'm checking in with my team. It's the daily activity. And, you know, the, the, what's interesting about skill is that skill is a lagging indicator of, of, of time spent doing the work, right? And, and, and will will give you skill, but skill will get you paid, right? If you're in business, right? like you're a beat poet right now you're just saying keep it going yeah so so like this is just i mean literally yes just yesterday i'm almost 40 and i'm 39 i got and and, and just like just now at this stage in my life i've been in, in business for myself in one way or another for almost 20 years and it just occurred to me oh you can measure that mm. like so somebody who comes to me now and, and I mean this in the most loving way possible because my business is not for everybody. Your business is not for everybody. But for who it's for, you can kind of measure your trajectory by the effort you put, you put in. And there are things along the way that will happen even if you have a, a, a 35th out of 34 nothing or, or, or a, a 76 out of 75 nothing. <laughs> you know, you had to do those 75 to get to like the um to, to get to the next right you, yeah you, there is no way that you get to that without going through the work but the fact that you find joy um or reason right to do the work it, you just have to trust the process right like you have to trust that if you keep at it and, and you're putting the right things in your head and you're 
you're spending your attention correctly, mm. you know, like you said, those things are going to happen. It made me think of an analogy that Conan O'Brien used on Michelle Obama's podcast. We were talking about implementing, you know, the, the process of, of children coming into a marriage and how it can shake the foundation of your marriage and, and in a good way or in a way that you know, makes you have to reconstruct or whatever. But the, I'm using the analogy a little differently. But the analogy, I'm using it towards our, our career and towards our profession, towards resilience, towards this persistence uh, that, that needs to, like this, this idea of, you know, you, you ev everything is, you're just accumulating data, you're accumulating experience, you're accumulating your process of likes and dislikes, you're accumulating sense of who you are. And you, you, there's this, this whole process is so necessary, although throughout those 34 auditions, I wasn't always thinking like, this is really good. I didn't get any callbacks. I was thinking, like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, that, that's part of it too. Because you, you talk about the questions that you ask. Well, am I asking the wrong questions? How can I refine this, my approach? Maybe there's something I need to adjust. But anyways, the analogy that I'm going to use that Conan O'Brien used, he said, a BMW in the dealership, every 20 cars that's on the conveyor belt that's made that's going out to the down the finishing line of the conveyor belt before it's going to be put onto the showroom floor every 20th car this little clamp comes down picks up the car and shakes it as hard as it can for two minutes and if anything comes loose if any bolts come loose if the, if the axle breaks if 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 anything shifts around or moves goes back down and then they adjust every car you know accordingly he used that analogy to say, that's what happens when kids come into a marriage. It's like, it takes your marriage and it just shakes <laughs> it around. If there's anything loose that needs to be fixed or worked on, it's going to come to the surface. Yes. And I think that's also similar with whatever profession that you're in. When you're faced with these no's, when you're faced with a tremendous amount of rejection, it's just going to shake the foundation of who you are. And, it's, and, it, and the things will come to the surface about maybe what wasn't so clear in your life or what, what wasn't so... Uh, sturdy in your own consciousness are the things that you needed to see and needed, needed to notice, needed to reflect upon. And I feel like that analogy is so fitting because in order, like that's almost, it's necessary mm -hmm. for our growth to be shook like that. <laughs> so that when you make it, through, it's the refining process. It is. It's you know? The fire, the, yeah. Yeah. No, that's so good. And, and like, I think it's you no know, full circle back to the kind of the beginning of our conversation. It was like, you know, there's going to be trouble. Like there, there are going to be hardships. There are going to be things that, that, are, that need to, over, you need to overcome. But with the perspective that you take through that, I mean, that's why I feel like these conversations and these little nuggets are so useful because like for a lot of people, uh, me included, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you too, like, Sometimes it's just a reminder, right? It's like a coaching cue. You know, we, we both played sports a lot when we were kids. And like, one of the reasons you were good is not just your effort, but your willingness to listen to the cues, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and I feel like sometimes things like this, conversations like this can be cues to just, re oh, oh, right, that's right, I, okay. It's not even stuff that's like earth shattering that you've never heard before. But sometimes when you're in it, when you're in the thick of battle, so to speak, you, your, your, your foot placement is not just right. Or your, the way you're, 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 you're putting your chin or whatever is not just right. And, it's, and if you can just hear that one thing that comes in and just corrects it, you have the energy to keep going, to keep yeah, moving forward. To bring up Tony Robbins again, that's what you mentioned before, a quote from him. He said something about like your golf swing. A lot of times, if you're playing golf, you think that you have, if your swing isn't, isn't where it needs to be, you think you've got to make all these big changes. It's like, but no, most of the time, it is such a micro shift. That <laughs> one little shift is going to make everything take off. And a lot of times we put so much pressure that it's, 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 you know, this laundry list of things that needs to change. Sometimes it's, it's just, it's something that's a, a really simple, subtle shift inside mm -hmm. of you. And maybe hopefully this conversation could elicit that in somebody. I know it's definitely been helpful for me. Sure. Reflect and, and make it like this, this has brought me even more gratitude about how I was raised. Yeah. Because I think there's a certain narrative we tell ourselves about the past 
And if it's if it, if there's a negative connotation to it, we repeat that for so long that eventually we're like, is that even real? Am I just <laughs> it's like, like this idea of, of really adjusting a narrative that may not be serving you? And I think the narrative that came forward today, I really it brings a tremendous amount of gratitude for my my parents, and and that, that's such a gift to me. So thank you. Hey man, uh, this is this whole thing has been a gift gift to me, man, and. Um, I thank you that that we got to make this work. Um, I was grateful. And so with that, um, anybody who wants to, I'm going to connect all the links below. If anything in this video uh, touched you, make sure you like, subscribe to the channel so that more people can get touched by it. Uh, I'm not monetizing this channel. I just want to see, I just want to see it get uh, out there to, to help other people. And you can be a part of that also by making some comments. Let us know how it hits you in ways that we can, um, you know, always make stuff better. Uh, not sure how we can get much better from here, but, you know, life has a funny way of causing us to grow, right? So, uh, man, this has been a pleasure. And for all of you out there watching, as always, build a vision, build a life. Peace.